know her too, and she showed up every day at about 11 o'clock and helped Carol with the, with the food and to help feed us and uh, was just a real servant. And uh, I just met a young lady that just had the fire of God in her heart and uh, a young lady that God had just truly called to do something extraordinary. And I told her, I said, Rebecca, if you ever get back to the States, I, wanna, I want you to share your heart with my church. So let's uh, have a good Shenandoah Assembly of God for uh, Rebecca Moore. Good morning. You guys have the honor of being the first church in Iowa I've ever preached in. <laughs> but it looks a lot like northern Missouri, so I don't know how much difference there is there. Thank you for welcoming me. And I got in yesterday evening, and I looked around town and says, yeah, it looks about right, you know, and everybody is very friendly. And I went down for coffee this morning. Everybody in the hotel lobby is talking to everybody. And I said, well, this looks like the liar's table in Ava. I think I'll just join and <laughs> y'all know what the liar's table is, right? That's where all the old farmers meet for coffee in the morning. And you only believe about 10% of what you hear, and that you better analyze very closely. All right. I, yeah. <laughs> I heard an amen over there. But don't worry, I'm not doing liar's table style this morning. Everything I tell you is an honest truth. Uh, I save those stories. You know, if it's not hunting or fishing, I'm usually pretty honest. Um, turkey season starts tomorrow in Missouri, gun season. And I'll get back home probably Tuesday night. So Wednesday morning, I plan on being in the turkey woods. And uh, deer season, I did not schedule well. I'm going to be out of state, and I'm going to be in New York for most of deer season. That is just bad. But I'll get a couple days in there. That's all I need to get one. So with that, let's open the Word. And I'm going to just basically share my heart, and that's what your pastor had asked me to do. And so I was just kind of mulling over how do I want to structure that because I know I'm new to y'all. My name's Rebecca Moore, uh, or Becky is fine. Um, like I said, I grew up in southern Missouri. I grew up on a farm out, about five miles out of Ava. We are about 3,000 people, but we're actually a very important city. <clears throat> we are the county seat, and so we're the trading area for about 15,000, 20,000 people because between us and Mountain Home, Arkansas, there's nothing. And between us and West Plains, Missouri, about 70 miles, there's nothing. And then on the other side, between us and Ozark, about 40 miles there, there's nothing. So all of that comes to Avis, so we put on a few airs and think we're a little more important than those just a little further south of us. But um, I love the country. I grew up in the country. But God has a way of sometimes turning things on their head. You know that? If you don't know that, you ain't been a Christian a very long time. <laughs> if you serve the Lord very long, you know that. And from the time I was a child, I grew up in a Christian home, and I thank God for that. And I grew up in a pastor's home from the time I was about eight years old. Dad was called in the ministry whenever I was about six, seven, and started pastoring when I was about eight. And so I grew up knowing to some degree what just the normal struggles of ministry life were. And, you know, small churches trying to make ends meet. And Dad was bivocational. He was selling insurance. And, you know, the pastor ends up paying most of the church bills and those kinds of struggles that just go with, with a lot of small churches in rural America. And so I was familiar with that. But from the time that I was very small, the first time that I knew that I heard the voice of the Lord, clearly, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I was five years old. And I had just started kindergarten. And the Lord woke me up one morning with a dream that I knew was from him. And I even told my mom on the way up to the bus that morning, and I said, God talked to me last night. And, you know, I get that. That's nice, dear. <laughs> but I still remember it 35 years later. And in that dream, the Lord spoke to me and told me, I'm going to use you. You're going to be my witness. Go and preach my word. And I didn't know what direction that would take, but I woke up that morning and tears running down my face. And I said, all right, whatever that means. And over the next few years, those elementary years, I almost wish the kids were in here this morning. But those of the younger ones that are here, listen, and adults, don't despise what God says to children. 
through those elementary years, God just continued to speak to my heart and just continued to draw my heart. I read lots of biographies of ministers and missionaries and servants of God from different eras and time periods. And I read my Bible, which has a lot of awesome stories in there. If you're not aware of it, some great stuff in there. And the Lord just began to tug on my heart. And somewhere around eight, nine, ten years old, the Lord really began to speak to my heart and say, I'm going to use you, but not in the way that you're thinking of, not in the realm that you know. I'm going to use you with people that are different from you, cultures that are different from you. And you're not going to live a normal life. Normal, of course, is defined by whatever we grow up with, right? Right. You're not going to live a normal life if you follow me, if you serve me. By the time I was about 13, the dad was on the evangelistic field at that point. We pulled the fifth wheeler into a little town in central Missouri, close to Plato. It's a little burg called Upton, Missouri. You've probably never heard of it. Um, it makes Shenandoah look like a big metropolis. And pulled in the fifth wheeler that night, Saturday. Saturday night, I laid down to go to sleep. And I was just praying, just, you know, good night prayers, things, me and God. And the Lord began to speak to my heart, and he began to show me things. And this, again, this is just every several years. This is not something that I live on every day. The Lord began to show me things. He began to show me pictures and images of things that he said, if you follow me, this is what it's going to cost. And again, just reiterating what I'd been hearing ever since 8, 9, 10, 11. If you follow me, it's going to cost something. It's not going to be easy. I'm calling you to a Jeremiah-type call. And I'd studied my Bible enough I knew what that meant. And you need to make up your mind tonight. Are you willing to pay that price? Or do I let you go and look somewhere else? I was 13 at this point. And I laid there in bed and I was crying my eyes out. And I'm not a crier. (laughs) I was crying my eyes out. And I said, God, that's a tough call. I want to serve you. I want to be obedient. But this is radical stuff. But by that point, I knew my God well enough to know that no is not an option. If I said no to him, it would mean walk away from him. Because I cannot, I couldn't then and I can't now, sit on a church pew and continue normal Christian life knowing that I had said no to his heart. And I went through a wrestling match that night and I came out of it and I said yes. And literally, my whole countenance was changed. And the next morning, even, I had some of the kids that were my age. They knew us. Dad would go up every year and preach revival up in this little town. And they're looking at me going, what's the matter with you? (laughs) What just happened? (laughs) And and God began to change my focus. I, I was on the fast track through school. I graduated high school, and I was 14. I went to Evangel College. I went through there in three years, between my junior and senior year, so I'd have been 16 at that point. I spent a month in New York. I was doing an internship, and I knew by that point that the Lord was really calling me. First step was to the inner cities. I went, spent a month. I cried the whole month, and God said, this is where I want you. This is the first step. I was with, I was only one from Evangel. There was a bunch from upstate New York. Um, one of the girls came up to me one night and was sitting on top of the roof of New York School of Urban Ministry looking over the city and stuff. And I just kept hearing that passage from the book of Micah, the Lord's voice calleth into the city and who will hear it? The Lord's voice is calling into the city who will hear it. The context of that passage you can look up is, God saying, judgment's coming. Who's going to go and warn the city? Who's going to go and warn the city? And she said, I don't really know you. She said, but as we were in prayer today, God just began showing me some things that he has in line for you. 
And God spoke to my heart and said that you, he spoke to her, and said that you will see his hand in ways that none of us here will see it. And you will see the move of his spirit in ways we've never seen it. But you will also pay a higher cost and a higher price than any of us here will have to pay. And I said, that's not a surprise. I, I'm aware of that. <laughs> I'm aware of that. But I want to talk to you this morning a little bit about, that's the short version of the beginning stages. And I, it, for me, it's kind of, I had to think whenever you're, uh, I don't know if it was you or Annette that said, how did you end up in Equatorial Guinea? It may have been Annette. And I had to stop and go back and start thinking of the process. These are things you share first itineration. I'm in a third itineration. But it was good for me to go back and say, what is the process? How did I wind up here? Isaiah chapter 6. You may know this passage. In Isaiah chapter 6 is the call of Isaiah. And it's interesting. This is not chapter 1 like it is for Jeremiah. This is chapter 6, so it was very likely sometime already into his ministry. He was already enjoying a somewhat successful ministry with a more or less godly king, uh, probably his distant cousin. But when he gets to this point in his life, God says, we're taking it up a notch. We're turning up the heat, Isaiah. This is not going to be ministry as usual. And in Isaiah chapter 6, he has an encounter with God. And I'm not going to read through all that. But by the time he has this incredible encounter with the holy God, as he's never experienced before, this was not a conversion experience. This was a ministry transforming experience. And at the end of that experience, verse 9, I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for, go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. Look at verse 9. And he said, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. God was basically telling him, I am calling you to a ministry where you're not going to see big results. I am calling you to a ministry where most people are just, they're not going to listen. Because it's not a message that everybody wants to hear. If you read the book of Isaiah, that makes sense. You see why most people wouldn't want to listen. But Isaiah, I need somebody that will go and will proclaim the truth into the darkness. I need someone that will step out of their comfortable way of doing church in the palace and will go into the darkness and speak against sin and speak against the schemes of Satan and speak my word and call people to repentance. That's the call that I need for you to step into. That's what Isaiah was saying yes to. And Isaiah says, but how long, God, am I going to have to just do this? And there's no big results. And God says, basically, until judgment comes, which would be 150 years after his death. <laughs> but the call of God is not a call to big results. Results are in God's hands, whether they're big or little. You hearing me? But the call of God... And certainly the way I've experienced has been a call to follow his heart. I spent 12 years in inner city ministry. And again, the verse that just kind of drove me there was the verse out of Micah. The voice of the Lord calls into the city. The voice of the Lord calls into the city. Who's going to go? Who's going to go? And I worked, I taught high school in a ghetto school. Um, and I got lots of stories from that, but those aren't the ones I'm going to tell now. When I spent nine years in New York, three years in San Francisco... Um, when I was in San Francisco, I really felt the Lord saying the next step is going to be overseas, foreign missions. But there was no clarity in that. And I kept running into these people and situations from Equatorial Guinea. So when I left um, San Francisco, I moved back to Ava to regroup just for a very short time. And I went and I picked up an application for foreign missions from the... Uh, World Missions Department, well, actually from my district, started there, went through the process, had it sitting on my desk, and 
Dean Gallion, who's a Southern Missouri District missionary that serves in Malawi, I believe is where he's at now. And he came to our church, and he came up to me afterwards, after church. He didn't know me from Adam. And he said, did you ever consider foreign missions? <laughs> and I said, um, actually, I have an application sitting on my desk. <laughs> and he says, fill it out. We need people like you. He had heard me teach Sunday school. He says, we need people like you in Africa. He said, we need teachers, the biggest need in Africa. And he is in Malawi where they planted like 1,100 churches in 10 years in the decade of harvest. These huge results. But he says, we need teachers. We don't have trained pastors. We don't have people that know the word. And we need this all across Africa. The next morning, God woke me up at 4 o'clock, wouldn't let me go back to sleep. And said, fill out that application. And I'm like, well, let me pray, you know, read the word a little bit. And I just kept hearing in my ear, obedience is better than sacrifice. Forget prayer if you're not going to obey. You know, it doesn't work. <laughs> and so I got the application. I finished filling it out. And I get to the line where it says, what area are you interested in ministering in? And I left it blank. I said, I don't know. All I hear is go. But I really don't know. And so... You go through about a year process where they check out every area of your life from childhood to the current moment when you're applying. And I went through three different interviews with three different regional directors, Latin America, Africa, and Europe. And each one of them offered me a position. They said, you know, we have no problem you know, they've checked me inside and out and said, we have no issue with your ministry, but you need to hear from God. And each one offered me a position. The one from Latin America, de verdad, I mean, honestly, it was like a very tempting position. <laughs> they, and it would have been perfect the way my brain ran for my abilities and my background and all of that, I, of course, I have a degree in uh, secondary education history and secondary education is my bachelor's degree. I have a master's in uh, um, education administration and I've now gone back and got a master's in divinity. But, um, I mean, that would have been perfect for my background and for everything that logically makes sense. But that weekend, as I was praying and as I was seeking God and just saying, God, I've got to hear from you. I don't want to step out somewhere without hearing your voice. Hearing like before going to the city, that voice saying, the voice of the Lord is crying into the city and who will hear it. And that weekend, the only thing I heard from the Holy Spirit was simply this. If you go to Latin America and take that position, I will bless you. You will have a successful ministry. It will go well. But my heart is crying for Africa. Are you hearing me, church? There were no promises associated with Africa. There was no promise of blessing. There was no promise of everything's going to go well. There was no promise of success as we measure success. It was simply, will you follow my heart? Will you follow my heart into the darkest places on the globe? You see, when I was 14, I'd had a vision that a point would come in my ministry after many years of ministry I'd been in the darkness. I'd been in this dark underground place. And I came out of it, and I went back, and I was in like a hotel conference center or something. It was a big churchy activity. <laughs> and in it, I was asked to play the piano, and I sat down at the piano to play. But I kept hearing there was a door right behind the piano. And there was a voice that kept saying in this dream, are you going to stay here or are you going to go back into the darkness? And in that dream, I got up and I stood at that doorway. And that's where I woke up at. And I knew even at that point that God was saying, there's going to be a point come after you've been in the darkness. You've worked in the dark places. 
and you're going to have to make the decision at that point, are you going to stay where it's comfortable because you felt some of the pain of the darkness? Or are you going to go back out to where it's even darker? And when I got to that point, applying for foreign missions, I knew I was standing at that doorway. And I had a decision to make. To stay in the churchy culture that I grew up in, that I knew, with all of its issues, I know we have our issues, or to go back into the darkness. And again, it's like, what can I say? Saying no is not an option by this point in my life. If I say no, it's to walk away from God and never set foot back in the church door because I couldn't come in and sit in his presence and worship in his presence knowing that I had told him no. I didn't know beans about Africa. I'd never done a missions trip to Africa. 2004, got on an airplane, I guess March of 2004. It would be nine years this spring. I got in an airplane. I was going technically to run the Bible school. Um, The Bible school was very new. The attorneys, Mark and Victoria Turney, are the ones that had started it. They were leaving because of health problems. And whenever I got there, the first term they tell you, and I really appreciate Assembly God World Missions for this, they tell you first term we don't expect results. We expect you to learn the culture, learn the language. I already spoke Spanish. I'd learned that in New York. Um, but learn, I was trying to learn Fong because I've been living on the continental portion. Um, I just happened to be in Malabo when y'all were there. <laughs> and, um, because now I'm the national director over the schools on both sides. But I live in Bata. That's my home base. And so I spent the first term just trying to figure out, get my head screwed on straight, and figure out how do you survive in this place. Now, growing up in the country does help, let me tell you. You learn how to take a bucket bath with about two gallons of water and wash and condition long hair in the process. That's an interesting challenge. The secret is... You wet your hair first, and by the time your hair's wet, everything else is wet. (laughs) And so then you shampoo it and wash everything else, and by the time you rinse the shampoo out of your hair, the rest of you's rinsed off too. (laughs) And you use very little conditioner, just enough to get the fuzz out. But we don't have a lot of static over there because the humidity's so high. So if you ladies need some tips on that bucket bath thing, just let me know. I'll help you out on that. Um, You learn... um, When you go into a village, you don't even greet the same way. In our culture, when I walk into a home, whom do you usually greet first? The younger people or the older people? Usually, who's at the door to greet the visitors? Adults, in your case, one Missouri, it's usually the kids. (laughs) And when you see a pile of kids, you say hi to the kids first, and then you greet the adults. In Equatorial Guinea, you don't do that. You start with the oldest adults, <laughs> and you have to greet grandma and grandpa first and go down the line for there. And the kids, usually you don't even bother greeting, or it's just a general greeting. Uh, if you greet the kids before you greet grandma and grandpa, it's lack of respect, and that's sin number one in Fong culture is lack of respect. Um, so you learn some of those things. You learn the proper way to eat a monkey. Because monkey, now usually, and I've eaten a lot of them by now, but this last term especially, I ate a lot. But it has this, it's kind of like possum. Anybody, y'all got possum up here? Anybody ever cook one? Well, possum has that yellow grease in between the skin and the meat, right? Skin one sometime, you'll find it out. Well, that's like monkey, and it's pretty nasty tasting, that grease. But if you just pull the skin off like this when it's on your plate, scrape out that grease, then the meat ain't bad. It's just dark red meat, so you eat it and go on. Gorilla is much better. Gorilla tastes more like beef it's, and not, no fat on it. But <laughs> you can ask me how I know that later on. Uh, <laughs> you learn all those interesting things. I did study Fong. I worked with a tutor. There's no school for it. It's just now being written down, and there's nothing systematized. Um, so it's just basically learning by hearing and trying to pick up and trying to figure out how they change the conjugations and all of that without a textbook. 
uh, very interesting, and it's a totally different language. It's a Bantu language, and so there's nothing in common with English sentence structure um, or English vocabulary or sounds. But during that first term, I guess it was the second year that I was there, Carol Deal called me. I love my senior missionaries, man. They're great. <laughs> he calls me and he says, Rebecca, we need somebody to start a church in Mikomasung. Now, who, are there any of the guys here that helped put up that tab in Mikomasung? You were there to put up the tab in Mikomasung, right? Um, they came up for a date. Did y'all sleep there? one night or did y'all just move on okay they came up one day put up the tab and he calls and says we need somebody to start a church in Mikomasung and I said I don't know beans about planting a church I ain't never started a church before and he says oh it's easy now Carol Deal can say that <laughs> he says he says all you got to do is just go in and love on the people and preach the word well, he's about right. That's pretty well what it takes. But the details of that get a little fuzzier. And so I took a couple of young ladies from the Bible school, and we went up and started going up every weekend. Um, we'd go up about Friday and spend Friday, Saturday, Sunday up there, do visitation. You can't do open-air crusades, and it's really even difficult to do direct evangelism. Um, but we did what I called uh, uh, kitchen evangelism or yucca evangelism. And because the kitchens are open, the kitchens are separate buildings from, in Fong culture, uh, the kitchen is separate from the house. The house is where you have the bedrooms at and you have like a, they call it the comedor, which means dining room, but it's actually more like a sitting room and they may or may not have a table in there. And the kitchen is always open, and the women are in and out of each other's kitchen constantly. And so for three more women to walk around going from kitchen to kitchen and hang out and help pound yucca and help uh, uh, peel plantains or whatever is no big deal. You just jump in and grab a machete or a, a pestle and start, you know, join in with the crowd because everybody's coming and going. And so we started doing that and just building relationships. And they knew we were there to start a church. And, you know, little by little, we start hearing the, well, I don't know about their religion, but them's good women. <laughs> and when you get to that point, you can start sharing the gospel a little more. But we really needed a building because we were just meeting in, a, in the living room of the house where we rented at. And so I, you know, I called back Carol. I said, I don't know beans about building in Central Africa. And I grew up, my father and my brother are both carpenters. I grew up in a house with building we had to build our own sandbox and our own dog houses and all that kind of stuff. And Dad made sure they were square and had proper reinforcements and all of that sort of stuff for a sandbox. He said, you're going to build it? Build it right. Yes, sir. Okay. And so I knew a little bit about general stuff, but not enough to run a building program. And Carol's like, you can do it. Just get in there and get her done. We'll put up the tabernacle for you. And my dad and one guy from my hometown actually, came over and helped us pour the foundation in one slab of the floor and then said, okay, it's all yours. So <laughs> I used the same guys that had helped us out, and so I set the levels and finished forming the last three sections, and we got that floor poured, and we got the walls up, and I don't know how it happened, but like, I don't even know where to buy rebar. You know, I call Carol on the other side. He was on the island. I was like, I don't even know where to buy rebar in Bato. Where do you buy rebar at around here? You know, how do you get to transport it up? I have a land cruiser. Rebar won't fit in a land cruiser. And <laughs> so <laughs> all these exciting things going on. I learned where to buy rebar. I learned where to buy cinder blocks. I learned where to buy all of these wonderful things. I learned how much paint cost over there. And, and, uh, but I said, next term, if I'm going to have to build, I want to come prepared. <laughs> and so last itineration, I raised money for a uh, John Deere tractor with a brush hog and front end loader and little forklifts and a finish mower, which I haven't got it to the point where I can use that finish mower yet. I'm hoping next term I can use that finish mower. Um, and I took over the tab structures for the Bible school because they said, oh, great, you can build. So now, yeah. So now we need somebody to build the Bible school. They had a piece of property in Bata for the Bible school. It hadn't been built. And so that's what I was doing this last term was building the Bible school. But the thing that really touched my heart, this was first term, 
as I drove through a lot of the countryside, and every place we would go, you know, I always had people in the car with me, and I would ask, is there a church here in this village? And I would just look around, no. Is there a church in this village? No. Is there a church in this village? No. And we would go kilometers and kilometers and kilometers and kilometers. And every place I would ask, is there a church here? No. No. I had three or four different places that asked, can you come and start a church here? And I had to say no. Not because of the money. Money's easy to raise. We don't have anybody to pastor it. This is the voice of the Lord. Who will hear it? It's not easy. Even the Ghanaians all want to move to Malabo or Bata. Nobody wants to go back to the villages. And yet the villages is where the spiritual strongholds are at. Because everybody goes back to their villages in the summer. That's what defines their worldview. And if we don't reach the villages, we will never effectively reach the city. They will just be living two lives, and that's what happens so much on our church benches over there. You have the group that, you know, they come to church. When they're in the city, they're going to be in church, blessing God every Sunday, but every summer they're going to be going back for their traditional rituals and demonic invocations and all of that back in the village. And if we don't have a church there in the village to be the light, those strongholds are not going to be broken. And that just became a passion in my heart that even as I teach, and especially the second term as I teach in the Bible school, I just keep saying, guys, who's going to go back into the darkness? Who's going to go and lay down your rights? Lay down your privileges. Lay down the blessings, such as occasional electricity in the city. <laughs> who's going to lay that down and go out? And so I've set the model. First term, we went out to Mikoma Sung, and I was out there. This, this last term, I wasn't going to do church planning. I said, I want to focus on getting the Bible school developed. But I would go up once a month and help out Mikoma Sung, the young lady that I'd turned the church over to. I'd go up and help her just to encourage her and maybe help translate a little bit and stuff because she had three language groups in a very small congregation. And so she would preach in Fong, and I would translate into either English or Spanish, depending on what the crowd was there. And shortly after I got back, a couple that had been walking 10 kilometers each direction to come into the church for several years said, Sister, we've got to have a church in our village because we invite people, but nobody's going to come 10 kilometers when they don't believe in Jesus or if they're elderly or if they have children that they have to haul around or whatever. We need a church in our village. And I said, brother, the problem is we don't have leaders. I said, we're going to talk about it. and We'll see what we can do. And as we were driving back to the city that Sunday afternoon, I, I looked at Purita, the gal that was with me, and I said, I can't say no one more time. I can't say no one more time. We've got to do this. If I got to do it personally, we're going to do this. And so we started going out in the afternoons. We'd do the service in Mikomasung in the morning, and then that great speed the light vehicle. Thank y'all, the speed the young folks. <laughs> We'd go out and um, to this other village and start having services, and we got hit with everything because that's where the devil's strongholds are at. That's where the heavy-duty encounters take place. <laughs> We dealt with a lot of the accusations. We dealt with, you know, oh, well, they're really a political, uh, subversive group. No, they're really a black magic group, and the daytime meetings are just a cover-up for the real meetings are back in the jungle in the middle of the night. All kinds of crazy stuff. And in Africa, they believe those reports. That's not just the town crazy person saying those things. And the Lord began to help. We began to build. And just be the light out there. Now, there's no electricity out there at all. There's no supermarket. You, you eat what falls in the trap uh, or what you get out of the jungle. I mean, that's <laughs> it's, it's as tribal African as it gets. But there's a church there. And as I ended this term, I looked and I said, you know what? What a lot of people look at analyzing what's happened this term, they'll look at the Bible school building that's been built or they'll look at this or that or the, you know, the organizational changes that I've made and all this sort of stuff. But for me, the highlight of this term was simply this. 
this January, a lady who had accepted Jesus the first Sunday that we went out to this new little village. And slowly, 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 the Holy Spirit was transforming her. This lady could not. She is illiterate. She didn't speak Spanish. Um, so, you know, the only thing she got of the word is what she heard Saturday and Sunday whenever I was there teaching. And I try to teach systematically and so they can really learn it. But she wasn't in Sunday, in s service one Sunday. And so I stopped by her house to visit her on the way out. And I stopped by and said, Mama Lourdes, you know. What's happening? We missed you this morning. She didn't look sick to me, so what's going on here? And one of her neighbors had followed me over. A neighbor from three kitchens down <laughs> had followed me over and followed me into her house. Again, doors standing open all the time. That's just how neighbors do. And her neighbor is asking her in Fang and saying, who's this white woman? I've seen her around here, but what's she doing here? And, and Mama Lourdes is looking at her and says, um, well, it's my pastor, and she's coming to check up on me because I wasn't in church this morning. <laughs> and this lady says, well, what do you have to pay to get a pastoral visit like that? And she thought it was pretty impressive. And Mama Lourdes is looking at her going, nothing. <laughs> she says, well, what do you have to pay to join your church? And, you know, it's like, I want that kind of pastoral care. Well, I was... To learn later that this lady had been involved in black magic, what they call black magic, the, the very, very dark side of the occultic arts, since she was a teenager, and this lady is now over 80 years old. And her family had just told her, you know, we don't want a witch in our family. It's bringing bad luck on our family, and had forced her to burn all of her stuff. Well, that means death, basically, if you're not covered by the blood of Jesus. And she was looking for a pastor in the real sense of the word. And Mama Lourdes sat there and stood there in the kitchen and began explaining the gospel to her. Straight out, outline of the Book of Romans, man, which I had just finished teaching. And explained the simple message of salvation. And as I sat and listened to her explaining the gospel to her neighbor, I sat there and went, Yes! She's got it. <laughs> she's got it. It took three years, but she's got it. And that next Sunday, her neighbor came into church and accepted Jesus as her Savior and has not missed a service yet, as far as I know, <laughs> and has had none of the bad consequences that everybody said was going to happen when she burned all of her satanic stuff. And I just, you know, there's just a joy. This woman literally knows nothing. She's the one I, I preached about Daniel in the lion's den. And <laughs> she's great, you know. <laughs> I love preaching to old people. They're so much fun. They tell you what they think. And, <laughs> and she's sitting here listening to this story and going, no way. You're kidding me. That happened. Oh, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, I was cracking up in the pulpit trying to tell the story of Daniel and the lion's den. And she's hearing the story for the first time in her life and seeing the power of God that's so much more power and going, wow, that's awesome. You know? <laughs> and those are the things that I get excited about. That's why I'm there. Even in the Bible school, the reason that I'm teaching in the Bible school is to multiply the efforts in the villages. And now the guys can't tell me like they did first time, well, you just don't understand, sister. Yes, I do. <laughs> I'm from America, and I'm going there. So don't tell me you can't sleep in a village. <laughs> and trust me, it's a lot further from my culture there than it is from your, the city culture there to the village. So go. And we're seeing some slowly that are beginning to say, yes, yes. That's the cost, but that's the rewards. Luke chapter 14, I'm going to end with this. Verse 25, and there went great multitudes with him. Why? Because he was telling great stories, performing miracles, feeding them, taking good care of them. And he turns to the multitudes and he says, if any man come after me, 
Y'all know this passage? And hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also. He cannot be my disciple. This may surprise you, but God's primary purpose in this world is not to make you happy and healthy. His primary purpose is to make you holy and then to use you as an instrument to carry his holiness and his message of salvation to those that have never heard it. There will be a time for rejoicing. There will be a time when everything's going to be great. There will be a time when sickness is going to be banished forever, but that time's not yet. This is the moment when he's saying, I'm looking for the disciples who will say whatever it costs. That means leaving family, I count it as nothing. That's what it means, hating your father and mother. It doesn't mean I'm going to go throw sticks at them and shoot them. If it means laying down my plans, my ambitions, my dreams, what I want, that's as nothing. What matters is his heart. And his heart, if you listen, is for the lost. His heart is this, that judgment is coming because his holiness cannot tolerate sin forever and will not tolerate sin forever. But who's going to go into the darkness and say, yes, judgment is coming, but there is a way of salvation. There's provision that's been made through the cross and take the message of Jesus and stay there and live it and show the gospel, live the gospel in the dark places and be the light in the dark places. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes this morning. Whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Comfortable Christianity is not the same as real Christianity. This morning, I want you to hear that call of the Father. I want you to hear the call that says, who can I send and who will go for us? Who will say, I will not count my own life, even my own family, my own dreams, my own plans, what I want. And I don't care how old you are. This is a decision that we make at different stages of our life. Am I going to use my youth for myself? Am I going to use my retirement years for myself? Am I going to use those years in between for myself? Or am I going to say, God, where is your heart crying for? What can I do? Where's the darkness that you want me to walk into and pierce and let me be the light, whatever it cost, whatever it cost me personally, whatever it cost me relationally, whatever it cost, I want to go. I want to go. I will follow your heart, whether there are big results or not. I will follow your heart. That's the call. It's the same call that Jesus listened to when he laid aside his glory, his rights as the son of God, and humbled himself and took on human flesh and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That's the heart cry of missions. That's the heart cry of God. It says, Father, not my will, but thine be done. Use me in these last days. And yes, I believe we're in the last days. Use me in these last days. If God's speaking to your heart, and maybe there's things he's already been talking to you about, especially to the young people I'm talking, but maybe to the older ones, I don't know. God's saying, I want you to lay down some of your rights and your privileges and your blessings and walk into a new area. You don't go without fear, but you go in spite of the fear. That's what bravery is. You don't go knowing what's going to happen, but you just say, here I am. Use me, God. 
If you want to make that commitment to him this morning, these altars are open. Come and find a place to pray and just kneel down and say, God, here I am. Whatever it costs. Whatever it costs. The Lord speaking to you, make your way to these altars. Father, in the name of Jesus. This morning, God, I know that you've just been reminding me of what your call is and your call over my life. But Father, I know it's not just for me. I know this is your heart. Maybe not to go to Africa, but I know it's your heart for the lost. I know it's your heart that the church would lay down our privileges and our rights and walk into the darkness as servants. Father, I pray that you would move over, particularly for the young people in this church, I pray. God, I know that the youth of America today are categorized in general as a selfish generation, as a me generation. But Father, in your church, I pray you would raise up young people who would say, it's not about me. I want to spend my life and give it into the kingdom. Oh, Father, move. Touch our hearts, Father. Touch our hearts for the lost. Touch our hearts for the people who've not heard, who even if they wanted to come to Jesus would have no church to go to. And put the passion in our heart that says, I will do whatever it takes. I will do my part to get the gospel to those people so that they can hear, so they can know, so they can have a chance to respond. Oh, Spirit of God, move on our hearts this morning. Move on our hearts this morning. Let us hear your heartbeat. Let us hear the cry of your heart. Hallelujah. There's a song we used to sing, a chorus we used to sing when I was a kid that said, will you be poured out like wine upon the altar for me? Will you be broken like bread to feed the hungry for me? Will you be sold out to me so that I can do just as I will? Will you be light and life and love and my word fulfill? That's his question. Let that question burn on your heart this week. Let it burn on your heart. And if God speaks to you, maybe you need to find an altar in the middle of the week somewhere say, God, I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of doing things my way. I'm going to obey whatever it costs.